Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features The Uncanny X-Men number 204, cover dated April 1986. So the cover design here, pretty striking, by June Brigman and inked by Terry Austin, modelled on 1930s, 1940s Hollywood action-adventure movies, and uh, the story inside focuses uh, solely on Nightcrawler, so in the mode of Uncanny X-Men 198, which focuses solely on Storm, and uh, next month's um, Uncanny X-Men 205, which focuses solely on Wolverine. So this is Nightcrawler's solo story. Cover caption, Lights, Camera, Murder. So let's open this one up and see what kind of splash page we have. So this is a pretty striking splash page here of Nightcrawler moodily ruminating um, on the ledge of a New York City apartment. Uh, so the title of the story is What Happened to Nightcrawler in reference to his being left behind by the Beyonder when the X-Men were teleported to San Francisco in uh, Uncanny X-Men 202. And uh, we have our creative team here on the side of the balcony, Chris Claremont Ryder, June Brigman, guest penciler, Wills Portacio, returning from issue 201 as guest inker here, Glynis Oliver, colorist, and Tom Orzakowski, letterer. So let's open this up to the kickoff of the story. So it turns out uh, he is staying with his girlfriend, longtime girlfriend, Amanda Sefton, who's also um, an air hostess. And he has spent the night out on the balcony in the rain. So as soon as he realizes that Amanda's up, he teleports to the bathroom, dries himself off, and comes out with a, um, um, a bathroom robe and pours himself a drink, even though it's early in the morning. So Amanda has to work overseas, or she has to uh, work on an overseas flight. She'll be gone for a week, and she offers to stay, but Nightcrawler responds, it's not necessary, and has his drink. And Amanda reveals to us that the X-Men telephone, they'll be home soon from San Francisco, um, Nightcrawler is uh, not too concerned about that, so he asks, and she continues and says, they were worried about you, Nightcrawler, they're glad you're okay. And his response is bully for them. And he's thinking about uh, his pan-dimensional adventure from last year, which was the Nightcrawler miniseries, and how that was the life. Uh, fantastic worlds, damsels in distress, vile villains, and yours truly as the hero who saved the day into my arms my proud beauty and i'll show you how i won the heart of the jinjav sabi of bellamy anora why can't life be like that all the time and amanda just isn't in the mood and um he says once upon a time being an x-man was fun we were mutants outcasts from human society because of the powers we were born with but our hearts were light now everything is grim the joy the romance the innocence all gone uh, and Amanda asks him, why, Kurt? What changed? And uh, he angrily retorts, you wouldn't understand, and goes back out to the balcony ledge in the rain. So this is what's eating him up. Thanks to the Beyonder, all the things that had meaning for him, that gave his existence purpose, are tot, dead, destroyed. I don't know who I am anymore, Amanda, or even why I am. So he's going through an existential crisis. Interesting choice here by Brigman. We see this um, panel layout um, again later on in the issue, and it requires this uh, directional arrow here to uh, prevent the reader from naturally uh, following uh, left to right over to this panel, which would be out of sequence. So I was thinking about that in terms of maybe there was a different way of solving this and avoiding these uh, horizontal panels and this vertical and the requirement of the directional arrow. Uh, but in any case, uh, Brigman's art on this issue is excellent, and I think she's well suited to uh, drawing Nightcrawler. Though I did wonder, was Dave Cockrum not available um, for this guest issue? Cockrum, of course, um, the creator of Nightcrawler's uh, visual design and a favorite character of his. And, um, you know, Claremont in this issue is shining the spotlight on Nightcrawler, and what emerges from it is that maybe Nightcrawler is no longer a fit with the direction that the Uncanny X-Men are going in in this era, the mid 80s as we move into the grim and gritty uh, uh, mid to late 80s in the wake of uh, series like Watchmen, um, Dark Knight Returns, um, even Daredevil, Born Again. So let's get back to the story and we've got a bit of a breakup here between um, Amanda and Nightcrawler. 
where, um, but first of all, Nightcrawler continues saying, um, when it comes to the Beyonder, um, he asked himself, was this God or Satan incarnate? Or worst of all, neither? That's only part of it though. What truly hurts is that when he summoned the X-Men to do battle with him, he left me behind for some reason, perhaps because I was not worthy, I was to be spared. And I was glad I should have followed, but I didn't, I was afraid. I never was before, but this time. So Kurt going through this bout of existential crisis, angst, and his uh, Catholic Christian faith shaken because of the encounter with the all-powerful Beyonder. Um, and um, it kind of cutting himself off from Amanda, uh, where he says here, I don't know what's real anymore when a potion or a power or a being can change my mind, my body, even the concept of reality itself. You're a sorceress, Amanda. Do I truly love you? Or did you use some spell to make me? And that really um, irks her. So she heads out the door, the apartment door, slamming the door. And then Nightcrawler wonders why he said it. What a fool. Was it that I wished to test Amanda's feelings by hurting her as much as I myself feel hurt? Could I be so selfish, so cruel? Should I go after her? There's still time. I can teleport to the street or race down the wall of the building. But he lets her go. He doesn't go after her. And uh, she too wonders whether she should go back as he howls into the night. This is very interesting because we have Nightcrawler howling here. And uh, this particular jogger on the street who turns out to feature prominently in the rest of the issue wonders whether there's wolves in Manhattan. And the very next issue, the solo uh, feature on Wolverine, Wounded Wolf, also opens with Wolverine howling like a wolf. So two characters um, in distress, Nightcrawler, Wolverine, in uh, sequence, issues 204 and 205, both of them howling out their existential angst and dread. Um, so um, pretty amusing uh, to see, uh, to note that. But Amanda decides to head to the airport. Uh, she thinks, you got what you wanted, my love, to be alone. I hope it's worth the price. The price is their relationship. And meantime, this interesting truck goes by um, following this jogger on the street. And then we switch back to Nightcrawler on the ledge. Uh, the rain has stopped. And he notes this noise from Central Park. Um, that noise, it can't be, he thinks, so faint and far away. My ears must be playing tricks, but I'd better make sure. So he teleports out to the park, to one of the trees, and spots the garbage truck and recognizes its driver, Chambers, chief assistant to that mad cop murderer for hire, Arcade. So Arcade last appeared in the book um, in Uncanny X-Men 197. Um, where he had um, uh, an encounter with uh, Colossus and Kitty Pride. That was also a bit of a, um, a, a solo feature on those two characters. Uh, Nightcrawler decides to go after the truck and see where it leads to. And all the while he's um, thinking about whether he should uh, contact a legitimate superhero group uh, but decides that by the time he would establish his bona fides, it would be too late. There is nobody but me to go to the rescue. And this seems to be just exactly what he was wishing and hoping for back in the apartment with Amanda, um, an adventure um, which uh, he could use to prove um, uh, that he's uh, still the swashbuckling hero um, that he um, best thinks himself to be. So he makes his way uh, uh, incognito, well, rather he makes his way covertly, better to say, uh, through this garbage can into the underground complex beneath the uh, Funfair, which is Murder World, and he decides to cannily uh, reset the security devices so as to uh, render them blind to him uh, while he's moving covertly about uh, Murder World. And his thoughts fill us in on the nature of Murder World, and um, also we get that uh, uh, he'd love to play around in here. I bet I could use these robots and we'll see how that plays out later on. Um, but I'd rather see what's going on in there. 
from the sound and the look of things, Arcade's begun his game. And um, uh, Nightcrawler uh, thinks whoever is the victim is going to need luck, at least until I arrive to save the day. So there is, as it turns out, a damsel in distress, the jogger from the park. And Arcade tells her the setup um, that um, she's in Murder World. The rules are simple. Find the exit and you're free. Um, if you don't, you're dead. So the way um, somebody has paid for her to be murdered, and these are um, Arcade's assistants, Miss Locke and Chambers, and then the game begins with um, with uh, the, the woman, the jogger, uh, being fired into a giant pinball machine. And eventually she goes down one of these um, um, uh, holes and uh, pops out in, um, in what looks like a forest, as she thinks. So we get a couple of pages of her trying to figure out where she is and uh, what she can do to preserve herself. So in the forest, um, she is, um, uh, comes across, or rather comes across her, a bunch of colonial era hunters who are hunting a wolf. And then up on the uh, field outside um, the forest, there's 19th century European hussars, and she's in the middle of this, and she uh, jumps away, um, hoping not to be trampled by the horse here. Difficult to draw horses and animals, so June Brinkman doing a very good job of this um, on these particular pages. And then um, our character, we don't know her name, um, jumps into a, um, a river and dances across, jumps across these uh, floating logs. But uh, suddenly there's a shark um, that pops up. And even though she thinks that sharks aren't found in... Um, are only found in salt water. Uh, uh, nonetheless, this shark is um, after, it's a robot shark. And at this point, Nightcrawler intervenes, teleporting her away just before she's eaten by the shark. So we've got a bunch of movie references here, obviously Jaws here, and later on um, very soon, we're going to see actually on these pages, um, another 1980s movie reference, Mad Max here, as they find themselves um, in a desert and first of all um, the jogger mistrusts Nightcrawler uh, but ultimately he uh, wins her trust telling her the two of us working together we have a chance and she says words are easy give me a chance to prove them then and she says okay and meanwhile Arcade is actually happy that Nightcrawler is has turned up um, because it's going to make the game a whole lot more interesting for him and what he's always really interested in is the sport a nice uplighting here by Brigman and Portaccio in this particular panel. So here we've got this Mad Max um, homage in this particular scene as they've got their own um, uh, uh, car here where they are um, driving away from um, the uh, th these characters chasing them. And, and what happens at this point is some biplanes get involved. And I was thinking in the 80s, what movie maybe was Claremont thinking of? I was thinking of Biggles, perhaps. Um, he might have been thinking of um, with these biplanes, or maybe just 1930s movies. Um, but Nightcrawler teleports onto the wing of one of them, and then he uh, uh, gets the pilot out of the cockpit. Pilot is a robot, of course, this being Murder World. And then he writes the plane and uh, does this daring loop-de-loop -loop here and uh, shoots down uh, the pursuing biplane. Um, so pretty um, cool stuff here on these pages. And, um, and the shot down plane lands and destroys the uh, chasing group after the, the girl. And Nightcrawler tells her he's not going to land. Uh, he tells her to keep going straight, she should be all right. And he heads off and she's shocked because she thinks, how could you, or she says, how could you run out on me? I just begun to believe, to hope um, that he was on her side, but maybe that, that was what Arcade wanted. Maybe you worked for him all along. I never even told you my name. So a little mystery building here in terms of who she is. 
And then she finds herself in this uh, kind of um, oriental urban setting. And um, she uh, gets out of the car, which has run out of gas anyway, and notes how the place ironically, well, she notes ironically, it's a real friendly looking place as in the opposite. And then she is um, invited uh, to uh, take advantage of a sort of sanctuary and escape uh, but really it is um, it's a brothel she's been invited into and when she comes in the door uh, we have this gang here ready to uh, kill her and again just in the nick of time uh, Nightcrawler swings into action um, as he says himself cue the fanfare as the hero makes his dramatic and timely entrance so remember that Nightcrawler um, back in Uncanny X-Men uh, 98, 99, um, around that time period used an image inducer that he got from Iron Man um, of the Avengers. Uh, well, Tony Stark, technically he got it from, um, that allowed him to um, uh, dis um, um, take on the shape or form of a regular human being so he could go out in Manhattan and on dates with Amanda Sefton and the form he normally took was Errol Flynn. So, you know, this is part and parcel of Nightcrawler's personality. This swashbuckling, adventuring, um, daring do aspect of what he loves. And he's getting uh, such a chance here to indulge in all of that uh, with real stakes in this particular issue. So um, he rescues uh, the girl from the gang and then... Um, uh, um, uh, kind of tweaks uh, Arcade's nose by kissing the robot that he is uh, projecting from um, and mocking him by the way Arcade you should use this holographic projection more often you look so marvelous in fuchsia and then love to chat but we have to run watch out for that puddle ah heavens how rude how clumsy of me so dreadfully sorry and toodles and so this really irks Arcade back in the control room and he uh, declares that uh, Nightcrawler's history now. But we get a pretty speedy wrap up to the issue where we have busting in through uh, the wall, the X-Men. Uh, are they back from San Francisco? What's going on? But something's amiss because as Arcade himself notes, Storm has her elemental powers. And in this period since um, Uncanny X-Men 185, 186, she doesn't, she's lost her powers. So what's going on? And the team are wearing older costumes, uh, Cockrum era costumes um, for most of them. So he figures it out uh, that uh, Nightcrawler uh, was using um, uh, reprogrammed uh, Arcade's own robot versions of the X-Men. And so Nightcrawler nailed him with his own pieces. He really and truly beat me at my own game this time. So Arcade, having enjoyed uh, the twist, lets Nightcrawler and the girl go. And so we've got our one page uh, conclusion now, where on the upper, up, upper west side of Manhattan, uh, the girl has her apartment, and we learn her name, Judith. And we got this interesting conversation between her and Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler says to her, it's the most fun he's had in ages. And, um, and he says to her, Judith, that's the life we heroes lead. A trill a minute, huh? The wilder the better. Why are you so angry, he asks her. Because I'm scared, because I nearly died in the crossfire. You seem to take for granted. You're safe now. I don't think he'll come after you again. And if he does, call me. That isn't the point, she says to him. Listen to yourself, Nightcrawler. You're just like him, hooked on the excitement. The way you talk, it, uh, if creeps like Arcade didn't exist, you'd have to invent him just to give your life purpose. Is that true? Is that all you are? So interesting here because the issue sets up the fact that Nightcrawler is experiencing this bout of existential angst that he doesn't know who he is, he's lost sight of his identity, he's aching for a swashbuckling adventure, he gets it, he feels fulfilled, um, but Judith is making a really hard point to him that he's um, an excitement junkie, 
And who would he be or what would he be if he didn't have these dangerous adventures? But um, Nightcrawler responds, what I am, Fraulein, is the man who risked his life to save yours and may yet do so again. And he uh, kicks open the door of the apartment. There's somebody there, he's noted. But it turns out to be this pair, Colonel uh, Colin Lewis of the State Department and Colonel Max Ryger of the Ruritanian National Guard. And they say, thank heaven we arrived in time to find you alive and unharmed. Remember, somebody paid Arcade to have her murdered in Murder World. Your most serene and royal majesty, Judith uh, Rasindel, last of the Elfbergs, queen of Ruritania. So a cliffhanger there. Both she and Nightcrawler are surprised by this. And what is Ruritania? It's a fictional um, land. Um and it uh, derives from a late Victorian novel uh, by Anthony Hope uh, called The Prisoner of Zenda. And The Prisoner of Zenda was made into two movies that Claremont may be thinking of, if he's not in any case thinking of the book itself. Um, a 1937 movie adaptation um, starring um, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and David Niven and also a 1952 version uh, starring um, Stuart Granger and, um, and James Mason and Deborah Kerr. Uh, so what was he up to here? Now it turns out that this was meant to be the beginning of um, a story arc that would reveal Nightcrawler's origin. And the story arc was to be called The Last of the Resindles and um, he had worked it out with Anna Senti, who's editor around this period, but came to the conclusion that the story wasn't good enough, that it didn't work, and so he abandoned it. So we see Judith again next issue, and we have a parting between her and Nightcrawler. So this setup doesn't really go anywhere, but it is resolved um, in brief in the midst of the Excalibur special, Mojo Mayhem. Um, so it does get um, something of a resolution, but not the original plan uh, that Claremont had worked out in order to reveal Nightcrawler's origin. So that was what this issue was setting up. But um, in the last panel here, we have our advertisement for uh, next issue, The Wounded Wolf. And interestingly, because you don't usually get this, trumpeting that it's by Chris Claremont and Barry Windsor Smith. So Barry Windsor Smith, of course, a superstar artist and a major draw uh, for the next issue and the next issue i already have a video of it um, on the channel um, one of my favorites um, an amazing issue but this one pretty good too um, so i do hope that you enjoyed this uh, review and commentary on the uncanny x-men number 204 if you did enjoy the video please like it and if you haven't done so already subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this